<laughs> thank you to our fabulous front row. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for your patience. Um, we did want to provide you food. This is lunchtime, so it took us just a little longer, but there are tacos and some tortilla chips and some salsa um, and some water. <laughs> Free conference. Um, anyway, I'm Fiona Schlachter, and I am honored to be here with you today and thrilled to share House of Genius with you. How many people have been to a House of Genius somewhere? Nice. All right. Good, good, good. So the way we're going to do this today is um, we're going to follow the House of Genius format, which is timed, and I'll be the timer as the moderator. And um, we're going to go through the first, uh, the presenter, the clarifying questions and first thoughts will be limited to the front row as they, uh, they've they been through it before and I just thought mechanically it's just a little bit easier so that you can see how it works. And then when we get to the discussion section, we want everyone to participate. And so, again, I'll be moderating, helping Matt out, so we can uh, get him some good feedback. Uh, the way House of Genius works, I'll do my intro now, is um, it's a monthly feedback for, uh, excuse me, it's a monthly feedback forum for entrepreneurs to uh, present a business problem or challenge that they have. So the one qualification is they need to be launched. So it's not really concept review or business review. It's, it's you've got a challenge. It could be cash flow. It could be hiring. It could be your marketing vertical. It's something you know beyond getting your startup off the ground. And the genius comes in. It's anonymous. You don't really. You, it's a first name only basis for the evening. So you, and the idea was it was set up this way so the entrepreneur would listen to everyone equally. If they find out that Kathleen's a VC then everything she says is right and what everyone else says is wrong. <laughs> and so this was to try to avoid that and say, uh, let's have an organic discussion and really try to help out this entrepreneur. So what we typically do is invite um, business, local business leaders with various backgrounds, finance, HR, operations, sales, and hopefully a few investors as well, because you really want the diversity in the conversation. And um, we usually have two presenters. It's usually an evening session, and it's invitation only. There is no audience. So it's just uh, around one table, usually 10, 12 to 15 participants, so you get kind of an intimate feel. And um, at the end of the night, so we have two, we'll, we're just going to have one today, which is all we need because he's amazing. <laughs> uh, but we usually have two, so we'll go through a session like this, take a little break and have, have another startup present and go through the process. And then comes the really fun part after you spend a couple hours together is the big reveal and you find out who everyone is and what their background is. So it's, uh, it's really been kind of interesting. It was started in Boulder, Colorado about five years ago. It's grown to over 25 cities around the world, several outside of the U.S. So the format is tried and true. Uh, we adhere to it so that uh, well, you'll have the same experience here or anywhere else you go. And I'm fortunate to have been involved since it launched in Dallas two and a half years ago. That being said, we'd love to have more people involved. It's all volunteer, <laughs> just like Dallas Startup Week. So um, if you have any interest in knowing more about that, um, you can talk to me or Christy is one of our great volunteers and Stephen Ellis right there. Um, we'd love to tell you more about it. So without further ado, um, let's see, we will get started. And Matt, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. Uh, so does this count towards my five minutes? Oh, brilliant. I'll go for a while then. Um, my name is Matt Alexander, uh, founder of uh, two local brands and one or two other sort of random things that seem to happen around town. Um, one is called Need, which is the older of the two. Uh, it's sort of a cross between a men's magazine and a retailer. Founded it in 2013. It's been out in the open for just over two years. Um, the second is Foremost, which uh, just turned one, and we just relaunched it last week. Um, and it's our affordable, American-made clothing line for men and women. Um, and then I'm behind a few other things with a few other people, uh, like Unbranded, which is a pop-up concept where we give people free retail and event space in town. Um, and we just did it over Christmas, just over the road from here. Um, yeah. Sure. So uh, Need and Foremost are held in a corporate structure uh, called Edition Collective. Um, the overarching idea there um, has been this premise that I think people and customers specifically are 
gravitating more towards smaller, more specific ideas that do one thing exceptionally well for a very specific demographic. Um, you had ideas like Amazon at a huge scale arise in the mid-90s um, as a response to the internet being a bit of a wilderness. It was very difficult to get from A to B to C. Um, so you kind of needed these monolithic concepts so everyone could go to one place and find it relatively easily. These days, it's eminently navigable, and it's easy to find niche ideas that befit your particular tastes. Um, so our idea has sort of been building multitude of these, all of which can share the same technology, and they can all profit from having a great small team. Uh, so Need was the first, as I mentioned, launched in November 2013. Um, it has been growing very quickly. Um, we uh, are currently adding over 1,000 new users a day. Um, and tomorrow, uh, we're actually announcing a big rebranding. We're launching on iOS. We're announcing some new funding. And that'll be in the press in the morning. Um, and so the concept there is to build a, a hybrid between a men's magazine and a retailer. So the, the, the sort of very buzzy, quick way of saying that is it's like a shoppable version of GQ, uh, except all the products are exclusive to us. But it has that editorial approach. So rather than reading, you know, it's a shirt, it's blue, it's 100% cotton, and it's a picture of a shirt on a white background, it's, you know, people, we don't use models, we use local business people um, wearing our stuff. And you're seeing it in three dimensions and moving, and then it has copy that explains in an educational way or in an interesting way why it might be relevant for you. And then we only sell 10 to 20 products a month. Um, Foremost just relaunched last week. Um, and with that one, uh, the idea was to build some sort of a response to fast fashion. So companies like H&M. Um, and TechCrunch last year called it J Crew quality at H&M pricing, which is a really great pull quote. Um, the reality of it, though, is that we're trying to do uh, clothing for men and women that's available for under $50 that's all produced entirely within the US. Um, so we just moved all our production to LA. Uh, we just relaunched that last week. And um, it's been growing really quickly in the aftermath. So what we're doing there is releasing a new genre of clothing, a new type of clothing every two weeks. So we just launched t-shirts last Thursday. Next week, we're launching sweats. Two weeks after that, we're doing American-made affordable denim. And it just keeps rolling from there. And that comes alongside a series of films, interviews, things of that nature. Um, so I suppose that probably brings me to the question right at the end. That's all of what it looks like, by the way. Um, and so our main thing at the moment, and if you can't read it, I'll read it aloud. Um, our main thing um, foremost predominantly targets uh, men and women 18 to 24 is the main demographic. And then soon after, the second, most, the second biggest demographic for foremost is 35 to 44. Mostly metropolitan markets in the US. Uh, we just expanded both companies to 44 countries, and we're getting huge pickup in Europe, uh, Asia, the Middle East. Uh, the UAE is particularly growing really quickly for us, um, as is South Korea. Um, and so the interesting thing here is that needs demographic falls right between those two, and it's predominantly male, 25 to 34. Um, our biggest markets are all the same. But it's a completely different target. So needs average order is just under 200 bucks. Uh, the average order at foremost is more like 50. And so we have a small team, seven or eight people. And they're from great companies, Birchbox, Hilton, uh, Michael Kors, all over the place. And, and we've been doing a good job of it so far. But our growth has been predominantly organic. We're adding 1,000 users a day right now for need, but we're not paying for it. Um, they're just coming to us via word of mouth. And so the interesting dynamic now is how, with a small team, we can manage to continue that growth and remain authentic and loyal to our customers, wherein we you know, have very personal conversations with them. We send handwritten notes. We take a lot of care of the product. We handle it all in-house right now. With scale, that's already in jeopardy. So our big question is how to have two brands with two different audiences that feel very connected to us right now, but as they're both growing, how to remain good to those people and how to retain what makes us compelling in the first place. So as we start spending you know, tens of thousands of dollars on advertising as opposed to zero dollars or a few hundred dollars, how do we continue to be really close to people? So that's a big thing.
Okay, so just to remind you again, the format is, is uh, not, no longer there. <laughs> we'll do um, three minutes of clarifying questions from the front row here to see if there's anything about the business model or what he presented that you didn't understand, rather than any in-depth stuff, because we'll get into that in the discussions. Nick. Nick C. <laughs> Can you all hear that in the back? Thank you. Yeah, please, uh, for the folks in front, speak up and we'll repeat anything that maybe they didn't hear. Sure. Um, no, we don't yet. Um, it's something we've been wanting to build, but we've been wanting it to do it the right way. That's the general refrain with most of this stuff. Referrals can be kind of gross. You know, when you, as soon as you check out or as soon as you get an email saying, you know, please pass this on to everyone you know, and they've like pre-written a tweet for you, a Facebook post, it's just, it doesn't feel great. And so we've been trying to come up with something compelling there. That is a great thing. And it would certainly leverage the organic side of things, but we don't have it on yet. James, and then Nick. Uh, v. You Sorry, oh yeah. Uh, so he was asking about um, the average uh, amount of times a customer repeats uh, once they've become a customer. So the big thing for us is once someone becomes a customer, they tend to continue being one of our customers for life, pretty much. So we have about a 92% repeat purchase rate once you get in. Um, and we don't really know what it is for foremost yet. It's still early days. Uh, with need, though, it's extremely high. Nick B. So hang on, I'm going to ask you to take that in the discussion, because this is based on he presented anything you didn't understand, just clarifying right. early on. That's okay. Deborah. Um, I mean, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so she, she was asking, I mentioned that we send handwritten notes with every order. She was asking if there was anything else we do in terms of a personal connection with the customer. Uh, we try to have a lot of transparency, so we use a lot of different social channels to have open dialogue with people. So Snapchat, for example, is growing very quickly for us because it's an unedited and unfiltered look of, at the ridiculousness of our office. Um, so that's been great, handwritten notes. Um, I send a thank you note. It's automated, but it comes from me personally to the customers on the first time they order and then again after they've ordered three times. Um, and so I get a lot of people re that reply directly to me. Uh, a lot of people know that it's automated, but they they receive it extremely well. That's one of the main ones. Okay, real quick, Kathleen, and then James, and then we got to move on. Do you have affiliate program? And secondly, have you identified your social influencers? So we we have affiliate programs available. Um, mostly through things like share a sale and things like that. Um, in terms of what we're trying to do is trying to have it be a bit more focused. And so having it be an invitational program that we control the terms and have it be more specific to those influencers to answer both questions. So um, we've identified influencers. I'm not a huge believer in sending out a lot of products and putting a lot of money into people that have just a big Instagram following but don't have much of a Twitter following, for example. Um, Instead, we're trying to get them more involved in terms of creating interesting stories with us in a more of a mutually beneficial way. Um, right now, though, affiliates exist. You can get you know, a good percentage if you link to us and everything like that. But it's, it's not as built out as it could be, for sure. OK, you promised it was really quick. Thank you all. Uh, so the next thing we'll do is, um, so this is for the rest of you, this is called the first thoughts round, or it should really be called first thought. <laughs> it's, uh, it's meant to be first thoughts because it's cumulative, but the idea is that based on the ask, not so much his business model or anything, anything else not related to the ask, the idea is, is that we will go to uh, the folks in the front row and ask them based on that and what they know about Matt, what's their initial thought? And it's not, you know, it's not 10 minutes long. It's really meant to be organic and kind of quick. And I'm just talking this through because most of you have never seen this before. Uh, 
I'm just trying to explain why it's, it's set up this way. So the idea is that you kind of rapid fire down through people to kind of get, to get them thinking. And then we'll move into general discussion and we could all participate in that. So, Jimmy. <laughs> And I failed to mention the other hard part about the first thought for the entrepreneur is they can't respond. It's, they just uh, have to grin and bear it for one round. <laughs> All right, Eric. Mixie. Um, I've always loved how you guys have used local business people instead of models, and I think it tells a little bit about just the story of me. Um, and so I think that as you roll out into other cities, that should continue to be a huge part of your marketing plan. It's, it's something that companies like Uber, I feel like, have done well, where they've gone in and they've organically become a part of that community and each, each different market. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just kind of a maybe challenging the question a little bit. Um, you talked a lot about organic growth and, and the authenticity of the brands, and, and you mentioned kind of the umbrella company and the idea of launching kind of new brands uh, as new segments or niches arrive that you want to explore. Uh, and you know, there's there's an implicit uh, kind of ask, and they're saying, hey, we're going to start putting gasoline on our growth rather than just continue to organically grow and, and be authentic. And, and really, question: Do you need to do it? Uh, is, the, is there the pressure, maybe from outside investors, whatever, to start doing that? Um, and, and really just going back to your core and saying, hey, these, this is who we are, this is what we want to do, and we're within those parameters, you know, why do it in the first place? Um, yeah. Hey, my first thought is you've got an easy answer. And so I guess we'll get to that in the discussion, but I don't think you've got a problem at all. Um, you're, it's just a classic branding, how do I keep my authenticity question, and it's, it's solvable, easy to do, I think. Uh, Nick mentioned Uber, and it kind of sparked some thoughts for me. Um, one of the things that's always really interested me about Uber is the way that they grow into every new market that they grow in. They hire three employees, um, and they're very specific in what those three employees do, and they're very focused on that individual market. And I don't necessarily see it as you need to do that for every city, but for uh, the um, there's an implication that you're looking at other brands, too, that target very specific niches. Instead of you being that person, having that two or three person team that is owning that brand allows you to scale in a much uh, safer way and allow them to kind of have their own vertical block that they manage while you guys figure out what every team needs individually. Uh, my first thought uh, attributes a lot of what you've done to the personalized efforts. Um, so my first thought is, how much of a competitive advantage do you see that in your marketplace? And the, the second piece on that is um, identifying all those pieces and figuring out what people are really attracted to. I think someone said it along the way. Um, but the 80-20 rule, like, uh, what's the 20% of things that people are actually resonating with? And can you get rid of all the other 80%? And that was my first thought. Thanks, everyone. Um, so Matt, I would say my first thought is I really don't know how you can do that. Keep the authenticity of sending private, you know, personal notes from you and scale. I just don't think it's possible. It seems like you need to come up with a different approach. But. So with that, um, thanks, everybody. Appreciate uh, and especially appreciate these folks coming back. They've all been to the House of Genius before, so they kind of knew the drill. But at this point, what we'll do is we have 30 minutes to have an open discussion about this same issue. So we're going to give Matt a chance to respond because there were a lot of first thoughts that he probably wants to get back to. Um, but feel free, if you've got some feedback for Matt on this issue, 
you know, raise your hand. Um, I don't think the audio in here is so good or the acoustics are so good. So I think this goes um, pretty far. It goes to here. <laughs> so um, so let's try to, try to use this if we can. So Matt, what do you want to respond to? Uh, that was all really good stuff. Um, <laughs> um, uh, to the questions, uh, to the points. So on the personalization and the localization idea, that was one of the things that came up really early days for Needs specifically was that uh, when the company was just started, it was still just me. I was the only employee. And the immediate question that would come up from investors was, how could you possibly scale that voice? And so to your point about building sort of a brand guide, that is what we did. And so I still write a lot of the copy, but for example, I was just away for a lot of last month. Uh, I got married. and. While I was away, I switched off email, and uh, um, and someone else, our, our financial guy, wrote all the copy. They managed the whole site, and the tone of it all. Did you say your all, financial guy wrote all the copy? Yeah, it's great. Um, Matt's going to do a whole session on hiring next. I, yeah, I have a very specific way of hiring people. Um, no, and so we we've had this whole sort of we've built this character of the need voice. We're doing it with the foremost voice too. It, like the need voice is more written. Um, and it has a very strong and obvious sense of opinions, whereas the foremost voice is much more visual and has a much stronger voice in terms of ethics. And so we've been trying to have that established so that there's a raw code that at any given time, if you're going to make a decision, you're, you're more than welcome to do so, and you have complete autonomy within the company, but check it against this code of honors sort of thing. Um, and so that's kind of what we've got going there in terms of um, I'm trying to think of what came up. I mean, There's a metrics question. Jimmy, didn't you have a metrics question? Yeah, questions? someone did. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're not measuring it. Um, we, we get we, 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 all the support email that comes into us from live chat, everything pumps straight into Intercom uh, from support email to everything. Um, everything that comes in, we pump straight into our Slack that everyone sees as a company. So the idea being that. We do it with like sales, we do it with traffic spikes, we do it with everything. So everyone knows exactly what people are saying about the product, about the experience, about everything. And so the result there um, is when people write support email to us, they don't say, dear need, dear foremost. They say, dear Kristen or dear Matt. And it's a very personal connection. And so that is definitely not scalable. And the personal notes aren't scalable because we have to start outsourcing logistics, particularly now that we're international. We're, we're about to put open a warehouse in London and LA and sort of start expanding in that regard. So, so you just, what you do is you open up the Slack channel to your favorite customers and you let them help you out. Yeah. We've, we've talked about doing that sort of thing. I mean, trying to latch on to different communities and just try to remain available to them. But you know, those are the sorts of things we're trying to work out. Anyone else have some feedback? Hey, Tavs. So when you go to the other, uh, some one of the people had mentioned about, uh, I think it was him, had mentioned about the Uber model, hiring three three key employees in each uh, or in key locations that you that you go out to. But I wanted to ask, so you have two different companies with with two different avenues to look. When you move to a new city or country, are you moving both of them or just one of them at a time? So that's where a lot of the challenge is. Um, Foremost, which is our, our brand that we develop in-house, the affordable one, that one is much more an economy of scale. So that one, we're expanding into countries um, and just trying to have ethical production in each one. Uh, with Need, uh, which is the older of the two, um, with that one, it's trying to localize by metropolitan area in different, in different countries. So on the need side, it's pretty clear cut. We, what we did here to find initial traction was we latched onto the local startup community, the local photography community, you know, all these different people making really interesting things in town that don't necessarily always have a voice. You know, a lot of companies in town will turn to a company like the Richards Group for their creative work, whereas you could just be turning to a co-working space in the design district or in Deep Ellum, wherever you need to go. And so that's what we did to have momentum there so that people felt empowered and accountable for our success. And that's a repeatable model to the Uber point about going into London and trying to find a creative community that, that needs a voice and, and wants to be um, sort of shown off to the world. Uh, the foremost question, it's, and it still remains a small team, but it's just trying to instill the sense of ethics into everyone. But that is probably one of the biggest problems with all of this, is trying to keep it small, trying to keep it accountable, trying to avoid like too crazy of growth. Um, but at the same time, having to put bodies in place. And so 
it's that's probably the biggest delicacy with the whole thing, and I don't have a full answer for it yet. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely an element of it where it's becoming a recognizable brand, both of them. And so there are people, like the, the organic growth, it, it tends to snowball, right? Like it'll start small and you get your initial sort of thousand true fans and then suddenly they start telling 10 of their mates and suddenly you have loads of people coming. Um, and that happens over time. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, I think at the same time, though, there's, I mean, the menswear industry on the need side of things is worth $130 billion a year, but men still don't particularly enjoy shopping. And although we've amassed a few hundred thousand users, um, that's barely scratching the surface, right? And so part of the delicacy is trying to look at that and say, there's a huge opportunity for growth, but do we really want to target all of those people? What would keep us interesting for all of that? What would sabotage what made us compelling for those thousand people in the initial days, which are usually your most important audience? Um, and so it's just that tension between the two. There's the opportunity. To, it's the classic problem with every e-commerce company. You see them start sending you, you tw two emails a day after a few years of them being around, and it's suddenly awful to work with them. And they, you see them all. They hit like a billion dollar valuation, and then they start to collapse, and then they sell for a fraction of it. It's because as soon as you hit your apex point, you've started doing less than stellar marketing techniques on the way up. And when you get to the top, everyone gets kind of fed up with it, and it's much less authentic, and you, they, they plummet. And so the model for us is to build smaller ideas that never like individually have to be worth you know, a billion dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars, but each of them individually can do one thing really well for a smaller group, and then you put that all together and it's something much more meaningful. So, I don't know, we'll see. So, um, I just want to, and this is great, thank you, Matt. I just want to remind you in the feedback here, so Matt's really helping us understand what his business is, but his ask is, so he's got this small team that's doing really a diverse set of brands, so around that, if we could give him feedback on your thoughts for that, that'd be great. Hi. I apologize, I came in late, so I actually don't even know what the product is, but from what all the comments and stuff, have you thought about or, de or developed a, like a brand ambassador program? You might have answered this earlier, as I said, but you know that might help you with authenticity and develop a brand ambassador program. So it's a great question. The, the prospect, the, the conversation of influencers came up earlier, um, and so it, it's something we've been looking at, but I just, the problem with brand ambassadors is that um, if you're going out and asking for brand ambassadors, you're mostly going to get people that trade in an economy of how many followers they have. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be great ambassadors of your brand. The best ambassador, ambassadors of your brand don't really know any sort of social currency. They, they just really care about what you do. And they may not be on Twitter, but they'll go and tell everyone in their life to go shop from you. And so which we, we think a lot about this sort of stuff, and it's kind of one of the problems and also one of the benefits of how we do things is that we just think so much about what might be horrible for the end user that sometimes it slows us down on stuff like that. So like we could have launched a brand ambassador program six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, but the problem is we've been holding ourselves back because we don't want to do something bad for the customer, right? And so, so we'll see. So I have two quick things on that. Um, the first one, the, the holding yourself back thing, I think is actually something that as you start this problem, you're going to have to be able to experiment more and choose individual markets that you want to do that experimentation in because the ambassador program may be a great thing for you, but uh, it also could have the exact problems that you're afraid of. Um, and I think that because you're still small and authentic, you have the opportunity to do that and your customers will forgive you if it goes wrong. But I, and so I think that there's, you're going to have to make that decision earlier than you can later. Otherwise, you hit the inflection point you were talking about where you're experimenting too late. The second piece I wanted to talk about is um, really interesting to me. You mentioned that one of the things that you really touch on is that m men hate shopping for clothes. Um, another brand that really goes after the people hate shopping for it is Warby Parker. Um, and I think the reason that Warby Parker, despite being so big, maintains their authenticity, at least to me, is they have empowered their community to be their spokespeople without necessarily giving them too big of a voice with the pictures thing. Um, that's a very easy thing, I think, for you guys to kind of piggyback off of without necessarily um, putting your brand in the hands of your community too much. You've given them a tool that allows them to very specifically interact without necessarily stepping outside the 
your specific morals or, or ethics that you're trying to build into your company. Yeah, that's great. Okay, and I just wanted to kind of take it up a little bit yeah. because I think what's happened is we started talking about tactics. So I'm gonna go back to your comment about what is your competitive point of difference? What is your competitive advantage? Don't wanna talk about it right now, but do you have that in your head? Can you really articulate that? And then start with your strategy. What is it you wanna go, then identify your metrics. If you don't have them identified yet, you've gotta do that first before you get to all these tactical levels. Then I think you get to your tactics and find out, and I agree, I think you start experimenting now with some of those tactics to figure out what works. But you've gotta get your metrics identified, you've gotta get your competitive advantage identified first. So plus one to all the panelists. <laughs> um, one of the experimental aspects that's probably very left field from all of this, a lot of what is in the brand is you, specifically there might be a possibility of, instead of trying to hire small teams for each brand in each place, do a micro CEO program where you recreate yourself in four people. Kind of the regional approach. But then, like, all of those people will then mirror all of your ethics, and you already have the code, so they can check the code and then keep training that way. Yeah, I like that. I'm just, I'm not a great CEO, so it's a little bit dangerous. Um, but no, I agree. We do need to find like little, little mats effectively. Um, uh, but it's just, it's just, it's, it's, the difference is though, my voice works for our current customer, right? But a lot of what we predicate this idea upon is that what you sell in Dallas in August is far different than what you'd sell in New York in August, and how you'd explain that to the customer would be significantly different too. And again, this is all this, this is answered by the fact that you have different people in different markets. But I think I think a lot of the key to it won't be trying to get them to repeat whatever tone I established early days. It's probably more giving them a lot of latitude to create their own. And so I think I think a lot of the key to this. So managing two different brands is allowing them to be their own thing and to gain their own momentum. And as long as we have the infrastructure there from the branding perspective and that style guide sort of perspective and understanding our ethics on each one, then if it's being carried by the people upward, then that's a much more sustainable and compelling route than um, me just trying to sort of replicate myself into different markets. We have to go find similar sort of people that think that way but I think the key will be almost letting it sort of free a little bit, but we'll see. With your audience of people who you know, hate shopping, another way that people, other companies have tapped into that is by taking out the process of having to think, what am I even shopping for? So what Trunk Club does, or I don't know if that you could feed on that level of a personal connection that you, you know what they've purchased. Uh, your repeat customers. You know what they purchased, you know their size, their style to an extent, and if they have enough, you could build, are you guys tracking that data to be able? So I just, I apologize, Scott, I'm not gonna chance here. So really, it's about how do you manage multiple brands instead of how does he sell to one? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm making a point of this, because this happens with every company we We get sort of a little bit sidetracked from like, we need a human being to teach me something, we want a bad mentor. Yeah, so what we've started doing in that regard, that's been probably the biggest focus since the new year for us. Uh, we came back and we implemented the OKR system. Um, so we have everyone sort of establishing what their quarterly goals are, and then we keep everyone in a very, we have like company-wide quarterly goals, and we have individual quarterly goals, and everyone knows what those are transparently around the team. And so we use a tool called Gel, J-E-L-L, -L. And so what it does is everyone puts up what they're planning to do for that day, what stands in their way, and it all goes straight into Slack. So everyone knows what everyone's working on, 
and everyone has all this stuff up on the wall about what the rules are, what the ethics are, and like that filter through which you can make a decision. And the result has been that for the first time I felt comfortable leaving the company for two weeks because the team is starting to really grasp it, right? And for the first time, I've stepped away from a lot of the social channels and things like that, and they're growing without me because they're becoming much smarter about it. So that that's something we're still going through, but you're, you're right. That's been a fundamental important importance for us as we start to mature. And on your question about, and I know I'm not allowed to answer it, we're introducing that tomorrow as part of our iOS app. It's called a concierge, and what it does, you know, everyone's all a buzz about bots right now, especially after yesterday at the Facebook F8 conference. Um, we've built a hybrid. So it has natural language recognition, and you know, it understands basic logic. So 24 hours a day for all of our 24, 44 countries, customers can send us a message through the app or through our website or over SMS and say, I'm hosting a conference in Vancouver. What should I wear? And we can send back intelligent outfit suggestions based on what you may already own or based on what we may have in stock. But the difference is, you know, Spring did one yesterday, not to talk about competition and everything, but they did one yesterday, and it's basically multiple choice, and it goes down that road. And I think it speaks to the brand thing, which is the only reason I'd answer it, is our approach to it is to have some of the logic and automation, but to know that the magic of it isn't um, like giving someone a multiple choice quiz, it's actually giving someone a compelling answer. It feels weird right now because the general industry conversation seems to be like companies are really proud that they have like an automated telephone support line, which is just the worst. And everyone's sort of going, isn't it great? You can text us 12 texts before you get an answer. And now we're just sort of saying, go straight to it. And so we're trying to do that with both. It's, trying, it's to the authenticity point. Anyway. So on the authenticity point, and to bring the conversation back to the managing multiple brands, um, he mentioned Warby Parker, but pulling it out of the retail space, looking at companies like Squarespace, who have a very personalized management of their brand and the brand platform, um, and they've scaled in a way that has broadened their brand and brought them all over the world. Um, so I would, I would suggest looking at other companies that have the brand that you're trying to create in, on a broad scale, and looking at the, the points that uh, led to their success, so that you're not just looking at retail specific only, but rather integrating the best practices of the other industries that have that type of brand that you're looking for. So my question in response would be, so the challenge with a lot of this, right, is is predicated on communicating with the customer. But the, the biggest thing that companies in our space often overlook is that people hate email, right? And so how can you come up with a mechanism and like you had asked about surveys earlier and i think if any if, if people hate email they super hate surveys and so how can you come up with a compelling means of communication or dialogue between you and a customer that doesn't feel like you're making them go out of the way to fix something with your business because that is where a lot of these brands seem to fall on their face and that's where i don't necessarily know the answer i think very loyal people will definitely read an email from me but <laughs> But what about the rest? Yeah, the pushback on that is the, the closed loop feedback process that you can create that captures the conversation with the customer who is not necessarily your, your biggest promoter, but rather captures them when they do want to talk to the business in whatever capacity that is, and then taking that feedback and putting it back into the business so that you can help the business. But that at least establishes the conversation in a way that allows you to progress and change that person who may not have had the best experience at that moment when they do want to talk to you and turn them into someone who is having the better conversation with you and talking to you about how awesome your product is and telling the rest of the world. But you need that conversation starter to get into that. So maybe if a customer lands on a 404, we can automatically send them a message through Intercom, for example, something like that. Great stuff, plus ones all around. Um, right, just trying to use the lingo here. Um, I, I do want to hear you touch on the this main point of and start spending money on paid advertising. Like that's kind of like a foregone. You've decided. Have you decided that you're going to do that and that's necessary? Um, and to challenge some points of, of look at a comparable brand like like a Frank and Oak. Right, that they've begun that scaling process over the last kind of six months. And they keep a lot of those hand touches. Have a concierge service. I mean, they're starting to do some of that scale stuff. Look at an Everlane, you know, with tr transparency, keeping that authentic brand. I think it's possible. Um, 
Secondly, on the, um, I hate my mind goes blank. That is just the worst. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear just the thoughts on, is it a foregone conclusion that you will start sending money? Ah, emails, you, you can do good emails. We, we hate them, but look at like a Matus wetsuits. Like John does incredible emails that I open every single time. It's two things in an email. It's very clean, simple, and it's not just about him. Like that's an email I open and read 100% of the time. Uh, and so I think, yes, we hate email, but we hate bad email. Uh, and could love good email. And, and you have the brand message, authenticity, and voice to send really great email, potentially. Yeah, so our email is, it's, it's, it's considered good right now. Uh, we have like a 72% open rate on average, which is ridiculous. And so, um, and so, um, and so, and so we're in pretty good nick there. It's just more that like, with every opportunity we have to send more email, which is all the time, like, we, we could be sending an email a day very easily, and we would be generating a huge amount of money from it. Email is just fundamentally the biggest source of revenue for a lot of companies in our position, which is why they send so much of it. And so it's just that slippery slope. It's like, how do you maximize each email you send, right? So anyway, it's just, it's just sort of a question out there. In terms of the paid advertising question, yeah, it's a big ex existential thing we're going through right now, which is you know, the growth side of things. So foremost is, as I mentioned, an economy of scale. We kind of have to be in, we have to be across the country and be selling thousands of t-shirts for it to be making sense. And so to reach that audience, we kind of have to start spending at least moderately. Um, and there's a way to do it right. Um, I guess my concern, my concern is kind of to your point about training the people internally as we all start growing and we start stepping away from it so that um, that moment when we sort of betray, when, we, we're, when we're spending a lot on advertising, that everyone is just double checking before they put it out there, that it's in keeping with what made us interesting, right? And so we have to do it just because the aim is to grow. Like we, we've been growing substantially year over year and we haven't been around for long. Um, we've been adding a lot of users, um, but investors want more, I want more. Um, I want it to remain small and agile and interesting, but I don't think growth precludes that. I think it's more of a problem to be solved, and I think we can solve it, but it's just thinking through what that looks like, and because you don't see that many people doing it in a very specific way. Everlane does an interesting job, but they spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands on it, and so it's, it's just how you spend that money, and so they've, they've done it well. They're a good example of it. Cool. Okay, so I'm plus winning this whole panel with this response, because I think the idea of metrics and maintaining your brand loyalty, the authenticity and a capital mindset on your advertising is key. And I think there are different metrics between the two. And I think just making data your friend could be a really easy way to get your strategy in place. And that's on need, looking at who are your longest customers, your most repetitive customers and targeting those people and those demographics. Because it's back to the 80-20 rule. If you can focus on those people that really believe in your brand and they are the brand ambassadors, you can focus your marketing on those people and their demographic. On the other brands, maybe those are quicker and more trendy, small things that you can just do with the bigger blast or something that's a cheaper media outlet. But at least that gives you a different medium focus on where to pinpoint your media and who to target specifically. Yeah, no, that makes sense. No, 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 that, that was just good in general. We are paying attention to the metrics, but it's more putting them to use. So to the point of sending email, the, we, could be sending, we could be sending an email a day, but just to very, very small, extremely well-targeted groups of people. But it's just the man hours that go into that, because that, that's kind of like a bodies thing. And you can automate some of it, but automation just seems like the antithesis of what we do in some instances. And so. There's just a little bit of tension there, but that, it's, that's, it's a good point. So to the authenticity and relationships aspect, I'm one of those people that you were talking about, you know, might not be as reachable. You know, I'm a guy, I hate shopping, and quite frankly, any emails that come to my inbox, you know, at the once a day rate are going straight to my spam folder. However, what I have is a personal shopper and my personal shopper you know has customers in all of dfw she keeps track of you know our desires our sizes i think she's got my birthday um so if you are going to you know try and maintain authentic authenticity and build relationship 
why not try and build a relationship kind of with independent personal shoppers and those types of people in general? Because I know for a fact, I'll listen to her before, I mean, I know her, I just met you. So that's kind of my ask, my take on it. That's really interesting. I had actually never thought of that. We, we've had a lot of retailers <laughs> reaching. Um, <laughs> We've had a lot of retailers reaching out to us to get a hold of our data and stuff because we have the editorial approach. There's a lot of value there insofar as we're not necessarily always responding to a trend. We can also help shape one, uh, which is one of the sort of more evil sides of it. Um, but yeah, that's really interesting, though, on, on a very personal level. Hi, uh, so one thing I've heard mentioned a lot today, and I think you kind of touched on it too, is transparency within your team and your organization. It sounds like a lot of your feedback with customers is about being transparent about the quality, about their experience. And if you're talking about expanding into new markets, you may want to double down on your transparency efforts. So for example, some people here mentioned that you'll have a brand ambassador. Um, make sure that the community knows who those people are. Um, really blast it out that that's part of the message. Um, and double down on quality efforts, I think, through those ambassadors. And as long as you're transparent and your customers know that you're trying to expand, but you're also trying to keep up your quality, I, I don't think that you'll, you'll miss your message with the customers. And I think they'll be understanding, or at least more understanding, um, of the idea that you are growing, but you do want to maintain that quality. So perhaps taking the team transparency to your customers as well, in any way you can. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Yeah. No, I think that's good. I think that's, Plus I mean, ones all around. I, think, I think, you know, the brand ambassador concept married with that sort of level of conversation with the average customer, that's something really compelling, something we'll have to look at. So I, this is just kind of a comment. I, I think we've discussed a number of tactics as well as some higher level overviews and stuff. And what I'm getting back from you a lot is um, that you guys have considered or thought about or all these other pieces. So kind of the overarching thing that I've felt from our conversation so far is that you guys actually, I think you have a lot of the answers already. I think there's a little bit of decision paralysis based on not knowing um, what tomorrow's going to look like. And I'm wondering if you guys should really put in place more of a cohort style system where you guys are looking at individual cohorts of people and testing all these things on them so that you gain a little bit of comfort. Because it is uncomfortable. It's hard as a CEO to step back each step as you grow. It's really hard to do all those things. And I can tell that you're uncomfortable about it. You want to interact directly with your cu customers. Um, but you can't. You, you just can't grow that way. So coming up, you've got the big list of tactics. I can already see it. You've, you've heard most of these ideas except the personal shopper one. Um, do them. I, I think it really is going to come down to trying and doing them. Um, it's a kind of a decision paralysis thing that I, I really am getting back and forth from you. Yeah, I mean, one of the main things that's like one of our goals that's up on the wall this quarter is um, experimenting in public and, and just trying things. And because we do have that loyalty, it doesn't seem as daunting because we could fall on our faces, but people will probably be like, well, at least they tried. And we, we've done a little bit of it, but I think, yeah, you're right. There, there has to be more of it, and we have to be doing it a little bit faster. I think some of it, again, going back to your point, has been that a lot of them are waiting for me to say it's OK to do it, to give that permission. But really, what I want them to be doing is going out there, making mistakes, and moving. And you know, mistakes are great. It's momentum. Well, so they have it now, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's just one of those things. That, you know, people want to impress. They, they don't want. They don't want to mess up. In yeah, no, we're, we're definitely monitoring it. Um, the, yeah, so she was asking about if we're monitoring like user-generated content around what we're doing and using it. Um, so the main thing that happens that one of the most compelling things that's happened is. Um, and I think it's a great sign for any young company is if people start to self-organize around your idea. And so the main thing that happened early days was that we sold out so quickly. And you know, we, we've we gotten to a more mature point where we can have more product now. But um, people used to get together on different style forums and things like that to work out what the best thing was to buy in our collection when it came out. And so there's a lot of that sort of you know, leveraging that scarcity and that feeling of exclusivity. Um, there's a lot of photography out there. There's a lot of that. We haven't used it to our advantage yet. You're absolutely right. Um, but I think we also need to come up with a compelling way of nudging people in the direction of uh, producing more of it in something that feels natural um, and not gamed um, in our favor. 
And so I, I think that's the main thing there. So I've heard a lot of questions about growing need as a brand or growing foremost as a brand. But early on, you said that your goal was as a collective to start fragmenting really early, to start fracturing really quickly and finding new niches really fast. So then you become a portfolio manager. You're really not managing single brands. You're looking at a portfolio of brands. So I wonder if that tension about growing need and authenticity actually is saying it's time to split, that there's time to start fracturing because there is another segment that needs to be reached. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. Um, that is kind of the overall idea. The, the metaphor that we use internally is that um, it's like a family living in a house, and you have like you have that established lineage. And right now, we have two kids, and they're going to grow up to be completely different adults, but they'll have the same shared ethics in the house. And maybe there'll be more kids. Who knows, right? Um, and so I think the main thing we've been trying to focus on recently is trying to we merged the two last about this time last year. And so what we've been trying to do in the time since is come up with how to reposition something that would traditionally be fairly boring in the public eye as something more interesting. So taking you know, a corporate parent company and turning it into something that feels like a compelling and unique product lab, right? And then having brands that live within that umbrella that have autonomy and they're agile and they're quick moving. And so I think a lot of this is a time Thing. It's stuff that's all in our mind, and I do agree we have to be moving quickly on these opportunities, but... Um, so, to me, maybe. you're not a clothing company, you're like HBO. You're starting new shows, and some of those shows have huge growth and huge longevity. They're Game of Thrones. Some of those shows are really, really small, and they'll putter out, and that's okay. So you have to be willing to accept both levels of the spectrum. Yeah, but I guess the I guess the, the response there, the logical response there would be that HBO isn't a team of seven. Sure. Right? And so like if we're planning to have one of these projects, you know, and they're very much on the path to being very financially successful individually, um, that requires ten you have to tend to that, right? And you have to spend a lot of time thinking through it. And when you're a small team, you can't really just sort of be blocking everyone's calendar so that they're just focused on need, focused on formulas, focused on project X, Y, Z into the evening, right? There has to be a better system around it. And that's kind of where the tension is. Um, and it's going well so far right now. Um, but I think, and I think it'll, it'll, it'll improve as we grow if we retain that focus on our ethics and how we do things. Um, but there's always going to be that question about, like, yes, there's always an opportunity to build another thing. But can we do that thing justice at this point? Like, there, there may be a huge opportunity, and we may have customers that are so ready for it. But if we do it now and we can sort of devote a few hours a week to it, is it really worthwhile? And so it's, you know, we use Unbranded, uh, which sort of exists alone and apart from all of this with uh, Brian DeLuca and I, as um, a test bed for a lot of this stuff. And so that may well turn into a third thing from us this year. Um, we'll see. But yeah, I mean, it, there's something there in terms of the identity, in terms of our mandate, that we have to think about a little bit more. I'm going to take one more question from the audience, and then um, we're going to find out who all these uh, smart folks are in the front row. Wow, there's a lot of performance anxiety on the last question. Uh, have you done segmentation then in terms of your current audience? Uh, what percentage are direct purchases for themselves and or purchases as a gift or uh, item for uh, someone else on their behalf? Fine. Yeah, I think a fair question is that it, we're currently advising another startup, and they didn't realize that through their e-commerce channel, 60% of their traffic was a gift purchase on behalf of the actual clothing wearer. And so that means 40% were direct for themselves, but 60 were actually being bought on behalf of someone else. And I didn't know if you had that segmentation data or not, and if I could follow up, what's the average age if you've done that demographic assessment? I know your cohorts, but of the purchasing. We don't know the gift breakdown. The, the average age, it's, it's male, mostly New York, San Francisco, aged between 25 and 34 for need. And for foremost, it's same cities, same markets, um, but younger and predominantly female. So it's 18 to 24, predominantly female. Yeah, the, the intention is to get people so they, like, 
the entry point for us right now is foremost. It's, it's a more exclusive, dignified alternative to what you'd find in a mall that befits what this sort of more discerning, younger audience want, um, but online and has all the hallmarks of an exclusive brand, right? If they do well there, then they, and they're a guy right now, they can graduate upward to need, where the sort of average price doubles to triples, um, and it befits the style, and it has the same ethics, and so it makes sense for them. We have a current big question mark for that higher-end women's market. So we're thinking about it. We, don't, we haven't gone into some of that data, and we certainly will. Um, but yeah, no, that's interesting. So a really super quick suggestion. You were talking about email and the tension between blasting too many people with emails and you know, trying to get that response. Um, if you give them the choice of when they get the email, it might actually work better for the customers because they have control over when they're getting that. I've seen that in a couple of new startups, and it works for me because yeah, everything goes to spam unless I pick when I want to see it. So, yeah, that's interesting too. Thank you, Matt. Come on, sit down. No, thank you. <laughs> We first saw Matt at House of Genius when he was in his first raise round, I think. Isn't that right? It was two and a half years ago? I think you had just... Two years ago, yeah. Yeah. So thank you for coming back. He's a very busy man. He's launching tomorrow. So uh, I, I cannot thank you enough for being here. It's fantastic. So Jimmy, you want to let everyone know who you are and what's your background? Sure. Um, my name is Jimmy Watson. Actually, my first House of Genius was at Matt's two years ago. Um, I'm a management consultant that focuses on M&A and the process improvement that goes along with the integration of multiple companies or platform companies, but spans a wider range of industries such as retail. I guess I have to stand up now, don't I? My name is Eric Swain. I was actually at House of Genius number one, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, by day, I'm the senior director of fan engagement at Funimation. Funimation is the largest importer of anime in the United States, so that's kind of fun. And then by night and all the other extra hours, I'm the co-founder of a company called Draw Attention. We make whiteboards and blackboards for laptops, like that one right over there. Um, so if you want one, please buy one and buy a whole lot. I was just talking about that actually an hour ago. Uh, hey, my name is James Blair. I'm the founder of Lions Mouth Digital. Uh, we craft digital experiences for companies online. Sorry, I'm bad at that. Uh, so we're a kind of a software development uh, branding, front end dev, all sorts of fun stuff. If it's on the internet, yeah, oh, yeah I did uh, a year and a half ago, and I survived, and I'm still still going, so it worked. Hey, I'm Kathleen Turner. I manage I2S um, Advantage. We help companies build uh, insights. So metrics was an important question for me. Strategies and innovation. Um, if you've had Sun Chips, you've tasted some of the products that we've made. Um, also, if you've traveled through DFW Terminal D, we've um, been impactful in that. So we work in retail um, for Walmart and JCPenney and others, and then also medical devices, uh, any kind of medical healthcare arena, tech, um, and consumer packaged goods. This is my second. Thank you. So I'm Nick Verana, and actually this is my first House of Genius, so this was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, I know, right? Um, I'm the founder of Tuo. We do uh, package surprise dates for, uh, for couples. So you pick what type of date you want to go on, you pay us, and we tell you what time a car will be there to pick you up and what to wear, and that's it. So you go out, you have dinner, dinner's already paid for, drinks, entertainment, all that. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm Deborah Swirsky. I'm an independent consultant. I work with startups on their customer and employee experiences. Uh, originally from New York, moved here from Boston last year, and this is my second House of Genius, and I was pumped to come to the first one, and even more pumped to come to this one. My name is Stephen Ellis. Um, I'm working on a startup focused on business intelligence and research, and I'm helping Fiona with House of Genius and coordination. I'm Christy, and I'm a freelancer here in Dallas. I do marketing and content strategy, and I work with Fiona at Health Wildcatters, and I also coordinate One Million Cups. 
Yes, yes, and I am Fiona Schlachter, and, and uh, yes, by day I work at Health Wildcatters, the healthcare startup accelerator just across the street, although we are moving. Surprise! Uh, I can't tell you where, but it will be downtown, and it will be this summer. Um, yes, we're excited. And uh, yeah, and I've been, like I said, I've been doing this two and a half years, and every session is different. It's a lightning in a bottle kind of thing, because it depends on who shows up. So um, we don't have the same people. We will ask people back, but we try not to have the same panel, like same people together, because the idea is to mix it up and try new things. And so once again, Matt, thank you so much. And SoftLayer is our sponsor, so I have to be sure to say thanks for them from House of Genius. Um, we have a little time left, and so Matt, if you've got time, want to let people to talk to you directly afterwards? Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Glad to be here. Oh, I'm sorry. Seven minutes. We have seven minutes in the room. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>